Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here, and I'm uh, grateful to be invited, too. I keep getting invited to these talks at uh, PyData and Python conferences, and I have to say I've always found the Python community to be really welcoming and warm and supportive, and uh, in terms of growth mindsets, very much not threatened by the, the success of others. So I think, uh, I think we can say that Python, Python is a growth mindset kind of community. Um, so I, uh, I have sort of two positions. I am two hats. I am uh, one of the co-founders of Julia Computing, which is a company providing support and training and consulting for Julia, uh, which is yeah. increasingly used in you know, finance, insurance, uh, aerospace, all sorts of things. Um, and I also have a, a part-time position at the Center for Data Science at NYU. So if anybody is at NYU and interested in talking about you know, Julia using it, getting involved, uh, let me know. I'm pretty easy to find on the internet, so. Um, so I'm gonna start out with sort of a little bit of background motivation, what my data science stack looked like back in 2009 when I uh, was doing data science but didn't actually yet realize that I was a data scientist. Um, because I think the, the term was kind of coined like right around then. Um, or at least that's what Google Trends tells me. Um, so in a single project at the time, I was using MATLAB for numerical linear algebra and machine learning. This was some uh, singular value decomposition and non-negative matrix factorization stuff I was doing. Um, and MATLAB is a really great tool for this. So I, I, that, that was pretty good. Um, and of course, I was in grad school, so I didn't have to pay for it. So that was OK, too. Um, I was using R for st st statistical analysis and for visualization because uh, uh, the visualization in MATLAB is just nowhere near as nice as R. Um, and of course, the stats stuff is no, not nearly as good either. Um, but then there were some things that needed to be written in C because they needed to be really, really fast and efficient. So I had some C in there. And then, of course, I was dealing with lots and lots of data files, lots of inputs, lots of outputs, running simulations, doing all sorts of stuff, shuffling it around a cluster. Um, and that, any of that stuff is a nightmare to do in any of these languages. Uh, so I also had Ruby to tie it all together. Uh, and I realized at this point that I had created a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, if you're not familiar with Rube Goldberg, uh, he was an artist, I think active in like the 50s and 60s, and he would draw these incredibly complicated machines where like, you know, this guy is eating and his spoon pulls a string which like flips a piece of toast up and then the parrot eats it and then that like makes the parrot go down and then it put like, spills a bucket of water and yada 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 and eventually like something useful happens but you know, it's just like cobbled together out of all of these crazy pieces, and that's what I felt like I was doing. Um, now, I wasn't using Python at the time. Had I been using Python, or had Python been in the state that it is now, back in 2009, maybe I would never have started on the Julia project, but, um, but we'll see. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, so this is actually the four language problem, but we sometimes talk about the two language problem. Uh, and the two language problem it actually goes under another name uh, that's older, which is Osterholtz dichotomy. Uh, and this is after, this was a, a term coined by uh, John Osterholtz, who was actually the creator of Tickle. Anybody's familiar with that programming language? Um, and he observed uh, at some point in like the 80s, I think, that there seemed to be two like classes of languages that were quite difficult, uh, or quite different, and that were sort of, you know, what things gravitated towards. Um, and they were systems languages and scripting languages. Uh, systems languages are statically typed, typically. Scripting languages are dyna dynamically typed. Uh, systems languages are compiled. Sc scripting languages are interpreted. Uh, systems languages have user-defined types, like you have a, a struct or something like that that you can define and then do stuff with. Uh, scripting languages tend not to let you do that, and instead they provide a, a couple of very rich standard data types that you can do all sorts of different things, like think of dict, right, in Python. Um, it's this one like really, really powerful data structure, or Python's arrays, which are actually, they get called lists, I don't know why, that seems like a mistake that should have been corrected at some point. But, um, you know, you can use them as a queue, or a DQ, or a stack, or all sorts of, like, it's a very powerful array data structure. Um, they also, systems languages also tend to be fast, whereas the scripting languages are slow. Systems languages are hard, whereas scripting languages are easy. So this is, this is the dichotomy, and this was sort of the state of affairs in like most, most of like the 80s and 90s. And now in the like 2000s, we're starting to see that dichotomy sort of come apart a little bit. We're seeing the, this, 
the systems languages sort of take some of the, the, the properties of the scripting languages and vice versa. Um, so because of this dichotomy, there's a standard arrangement that people have typically used to do things because you're like, well, you know, I want convenience, but I also want performance. I want both of those things. Um, and the compromise is that for convenience, you use a scripting language at the high level, something like Python or R or MATLAB. But you do all of the hard stuff in the systems language. So when you're using NumPy, for example, like the, the fast stuff, the stuff that's actually doing stuff with arrays is all written in C or actually Fortran, right? Because you're calling gloss if you do a matrix multiply, which is still written in Fortran. Um, so that, and that, that kind of works. Like this is a pretty good arrangement. This has been sort of the state of the art for, I don't know, 30 years or something like that. I have myself written many high level wrappers to low level functionality. Uh, and then, you know, you're, you're happy because you can, you can, you can get the performance, but you get this nice ease of use too. But it is not a perfect arrangement. Um, it's very pragmatic, but it's got some issues. So one issue is, aren't the hard parts exactly where you could benefit from a better language? Right? So like, why are we doing the hard stuff in C? That seems like kind of perverse, right? Like, I actually did try to, I, I was fixing a, one of our benchmarks because I noticed that C was cheating and doing less work than all the other programming languages. It took me like two hours to get this thing not to crash. I don't know what I was doing. I had forgotten how to do C indexing correctly in C. And I was just like, oh god, I'd forgotten how difficult this was. So, so this, is, this is a real issue. This is, you know, C programming is not super easy. Um, it also forces vectorization everywhere, right? There's this sort of like, you're tra taught that like for loops are kind of immoral. Like, it, as it turns out, they're just like impractical for people it, writing libraries in high level languages. They're not actually immoral, right? It's fine to write a for loop. The only issue is it's going to be slow um, if you're in one of these high level languages. You want to like push as much work as possible into the low level language. Um, but sometimes it's really awkward and you end up writing some very strange convoluted code to try to do this. Um, it also can often force like additional memory allocation, right? Because you have to go through a lot of, create a lot of temporary arrays in this style. Whereas like in C or something, you would just like use one array and then mutate it in place. And that would be fine. And you would not ever create any temporaries. Um, there's another subtler issue that took me a long time to, to recognize, um, which is that it creates a social barrier between users and developers, right? So in these two language systems, the users use one language. They use the high-level language. The developers actually don't spend that much time programming in the high-level language. They spend a lot of time programming in the low-level language. And using, being a user of the high-level system doesn't make you better you know, qualified in any way to work on the inter internals. You, you kind of, there's just a barrier there, right? And I, I even find, even though I'm like perfectly, well, according to my story, not that good at C programming, but like I've done a lot of C programming. I'm OK at it. Um, you know, if I'm using Python or R, I tend to like hit that C wall and then I just stop because it's too much of a pain to find out where the C source code is and how things work. And I just kind of, even though I could, I just don't. Um, so maybe maybe that's the moral issue. Maybe I should, but uh, but people don't. It's just not practical. Um, so Julia, as a programming language, tries to crush and shatter this Osterholtz dichotomy. When we want to have our cake and eat it too. Um, so you know, these are the two columns, and we do this. We sort of take mix and match pieces from both columns. Julia is dynamic, but it's compiled. Uh, we let you have user-defined types and standard types. So the standard types are pretty powerful, but you can also do your own user-defined types. And I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Uh, it's fast and it's easy. So um, how fast? This is sort of the, the obligatory performance chart. Um, this is time on a bunch of sort of, you know, Micro benchmarks that aren't really super interesting, except that they time things like how good are you at recursion, iteration, scalar loops, parsing integers, printing stuff, you know, doing a little bit of matrix multiplication. Um, it, it's time relative to C. The, the, uh, the y-axis is logarithmic, so you know, being higher up is much worse. Um, and the languages across the bottom, Julia, Fortran, Go, uh, JavaScript, Python, Mathematica, R, MATLAB, Octave. Um, Python is sort of where you, like, that's as good as a, a good interpreted language ought to be. That's sort of where you are. But then you have these, like, compiled languages like Fortran and Go, and then Julia is the odd man out because it's sort of, it's dynamic, but it's actually within a factor of two of C consistently. Um, and people actually see this on real life code, too. This isn't just contrived for micro. Uh, 
Um, I think this is a much more interesting chart. This is the same y-axis, um, but the x-axis is actually how many lines of code normalized between whatever the minimum and the maximum one was for each benchmark, uh, each language is. And you kind of see these two regimes. You have, uh, you have along, you know, you have this corner right here. These are the fast compiled languages. These are the systems languages. These are the scripting languages. So you have this kind of choice. You like, so or you can be up on this end of the curve or on this end of the curve. You can either be concise and slow, or you can be fast and kind of verbose. Um, of course, there's one point that's sort of in the corner here. Um, so that's where we want to be. I, li I like being in that corner. Um, so this is my data science stack today. Uh, Julia for numerical linear algebra, statistical analysis. Yeah, yeah. I use Julia for everything. Um, Python can give you a lot of this, right? Like you could use Python for everything but the C line, right? So it gets you down to, from four languages to two, but to get all the way down to one language, you, you need to do more. Um, and projects like PyPy are sort of like pushing in that general direction. Um, so maybe in the future, people will be using PyPy and like writing Python code, and it'll be like fast as C. So that's exciting stuff. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I am going to give you some examples. I'm going to do a lot of live coding, and you know things might go horribly wrong. Hopefully they won't. But, um, I'm going to demo how you can use Julia as a general purpose language, so not just a language for numerical computing. Although I'm going to give a numerical example, but you know whatever. Um, you can also use it for data analysis, uh, the usual stuff like data frames, and then plotting some stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to show what hopefully is a compelling example of a superpower for a, a user, and then a compelling example of how it gives superpowers to library writers, too. Um, and so that's, that's, that I'm going to do in the Jupyter Notebook. So everybody familiar with the Jupyter Notebook? This is a Python audience, so I assume so everybody knows about this, right? This used to be called the IPython Notebook, but now it supports like 40 languages or something like that as kernels. Julia, I think, was the first like real usable back uh, kernel aside from Python. Uh, Fernando Perez invited me and Jeff and some, some of the other uh, Julia contrib contributors to come to Berkeley and write this kernel, and we, we went and did. It was a fun week. Um, OK, so this is, this is what Julia code looks like. Um, you can do things, you can say that max iterations is constant, and then you define, you can have a doc string. It actually goes outside the function instead of inside. That actually makes sense in Julia, but I won't get into why. Um, and you notice that I don't really put any types or anything on here. I just say, you know, the, this is not, this is the Julia set that I'm going to compute. It doesn't really have anything to do with the name, but whatever, it's a cute coincidence. Um, so you take two complex numbers, z and c, and then what you do is you do this iteration step. This uh, z, you say z equals z squared plus c. You keep doing that until it escapes beyond a radius of 2. Uh, and the number of like, iterations you have to do before a thing escapes, it gives you like a color, which you then can vi visualize, and it makes pretty pictures, which we're about to see. Um, so you just you know, press shift enter, and that evaluates the cell. And you can see that you got a generic function now called Julia with one method. Um, and we can, you know, call it on one complex point. And you can see, I'm a little too tall for this podium, so I'm going to put this up here. Um, we can see some other points, like, okay, that's a slightly higher point. I don't know. Uh, so it takes more iterations to to, to escape. Um, we can do this with a comprehension, a two-dimensional array comprehension syntax here. So this is similar to Python's one-dimensional array comprehension syntax, but you can do arbitrarily many dimensions and get, uh, in this case, a matrix. Uh, so this is a matrix of the escape times across a certain range. Um, I chose the range so that at least some of the numbers were interesting and they weren't all twos. Uh, but you can, you can see this is 501 by 1,000, 1,001. Um, all right, well, that's kind of a, a, you know, a lousy way to visualize things. So let's actually load some packages that do more interesting visualization. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is define a, co a color map, uh, which is it's the co there, this, this package colors provides a couple of different built-in color maps. So this one's going to involve red and blue. I'm going to get 100 points because max iterations was 100. So I'm going to go from 1 to 100. 
uh, and then I'm going to use that color map to turn escape times. Uh, you see, if you evaluate the color map, it prints it nicely. You can see the colors. Um, it's actually just an array of colors, but the, we know how to print that as a nice thing. And you can see here, now I make an image out of it, and you get this pretty picture. Can people see that reasonably well on the projector, I think? OK, cool. Um, one of the interesting things about the Julia set is that you change these numbers a little bit. You change the starting point a little bit, and you get kind of radically different things. Um, and you get a lot of different really interesting pretty pictures. Um, but you know, going in there, oh, another interesting thing about it is that doing it that way is the Julia set. If you take this, so this is essentially a four-dimensional shape because uh, it's two complex numbers as inputs, which are each two-dimensional. Um, if we take the diagonal of this set, it is the Mandelbrot set. So that should probably be familiar to people. So the Julia set and the Mandelbrot set are related in this kind of, this kind of way. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting to, to sort of explore this set. So let's use this thing called interact, which gives you, you can take anything, that, so that expression I, I, I used to, to generate an image, I can actually just say, put this macro in front of it, at manipulate is a, a macro in Julia, um, and give it a range for sliders. Um, and then we're actually going to be able to, like, you'll, you'll see in a second, you can scrub the sliders around and get different images. All right, so now we've got that. Um, and we can change it, which is, this is a much nicer way to explore different things. Uh, and you can see that it, it kind of gives you, gives you different patterns, and they're, they're all quite beautiful. Um, so this is a little more sluggish than I would like. Uh, so one of the things this is doing is this is generating a new array every single time and going through, in, you know, and then constructing an image out of it. This is sort of inefficient. It would be nice if I could just pre-allocate one chunk of, of memory uh, and just redisplay that every single time and not have to like, you know, go through all this memory allocation because that's expensive. So this is a version of that which is slightly more verbose but does exactly that. Um, so I use a let block to say that what these i and r are so that I can actually use their length. That's just kind of nice. Um, so what I do is I create a, a data array. And here you see one of the particularly Julian things. Um, we don't shy away from talking about types. So classically, dynamic languages try not to talk about types. They sort of try to pretend they don't exist. We decided that you know the first thing, I mean, the whole, like, the whole initial point of NumPy was to have like, typed arrays in Python, which is this untyped language. And so in numerical computing, inevitably, you end up having to talk about types. So let's just have one good system for talking about types and make that universal. So it's actually just baked into the language, and the language knows about types. So here we're constructing a two-dimensional array, a matrix. Uh, the element types are the elements are actually this RGB type uh, with an unsigned fixed point eight-bit value in there, um, which you don't have to know about. But this is all sort of like custom types that are just defined in libraries. But they actually have the exact representation you would like for the machine, which is you can represent RGB values as just like you know triples of eight, bi of eight bits. Um, and then you create this image, and then you just sort of go over. And instead of, instead of constructing the thing every time, we just take a for loop and go through and just update the, the image every time. For loops are not evil, in Julia at least. They're not going to be slow. They're actually going to be quite fast. So now we can see that we can, we can scrub through this, and it's significantly uh, more responsive, which is quite nice. Um, cool. Any questions about that so far? All right, cool. Um, all right, so fractals are cute, but you know we're here for analyzing data, not analyzing fractals. So let's do a little bit of data analysis. Um, uh, I'm going to load this package called data frames, which provides a, a data frame data type, you know, very similar to the one that ships with R and very similar to the one that Pandas provides. Um, so I'm going to load this. Uh, Jared, Jared is here somewhere. Um, this is uh, one of Jared's data sets that I, I, I actually you know, just played with at some point and was like, oh, this is a nice data set. Uh, it's good for display, dem demonstrating things. Um, NYC housing, it's got a bunch of columns about like, different uh, housing sales uh, throughout the city. Um, and you can see that the type of this thing is that it's a data frame. Uh, 
And then I'm going to use this package called Gadfly, which is similar to the, it, it, it's a grammar of graphics style uh, visualization package in pure Julia. Um, and when I say in pure Julia, I mean like the whole thing is written in Julia. There is no C code involved, um, which is, is kind of nice. It means you can hack on it more easily. Um, but it, from a user's perspective, it kind of doesn't matter. So, okay, the first obvious thing you want to do is, we'll get rid of the headers so that we can see a little more. Uh, I don't know, plot some stuff. So like square, gross square foot versus estimated expense. That should have some sort of interesting relationship, right? Um, well, we look at this and it's kind of this like diagonal blob and you're like, well, yeah, I guess maybe that has a relationship. So I don't know. The, the first obvious thing to do here is like there are really big values and there are really small values and a lot of stuff concentrated in the little small, very small values. So let's, you know, let's scale it to be log log scale. Uh, so this is this is how you add attributes. If you're familiar with ggplot, this is sort of similar to the way ggplot works. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. There you go. It's you can it's like pushed pulled everything out of that like far left corner. We we now actually have things kind of spread out in a nice clean way. Um, still not like a little bit it would be nice to separate things out. So one of the things you can do is you can color by one of the fields, and I'm going to color by burrow. And you can see that now, OK, yeah, color by burrow. This is getting a little interesting. Um, and we can zoom in a bit. Um, and you can see that, uh, yeah, so Manhattan is the blue up across the top, and Manhattan is like significantly more expensive. You're sort of higher up along this log log scale than, you know, say Brooklyn is next, and then Queens, and then the Bronx and Staten Island. I mean, if you're, I bet a lot of people here are from New York City, this makes sense. Um, I mean, so you can, do, you can do other things, pretty straightforward stuff, like plotting a histogram of, you know, so since we, we figured out that like, you know, this income and square footage thing are, have this log log relationship, um, you know, if we take a rela uh, if we take a ratio, that should actually give us, give us some like fairly consistent stuff. So we can take a histogram, uh, plotting by color of these things, and you can see again, like you know, there's there's kind of two modes for Manhattan, um, and then Brooklyn is sort of further down, Bronx is you know further down. It's this, the same same data just sliced a different way. Um, so yeah, you can do data analysis pretty straightforwardly. Um, I, I I think that's you know that's useful. It's obviously interesting and like necessary that you can do this, but this is not one of the things that sets it apart because you can do this kind of data analysis in any of these tools. So I'm going to talk about some of the other things, the things I think give you real like superpowers. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about this is superpowers for users. Uh, this example, this guy uh, Patrick Useldinger, I assume that is a German name. Uh, he emailed because, and we get this a lot, this happens, this is pretty typical. Like I wrote Python code and I ported it to Julia and it wasn't faster, what am I doing wrong? Or you are a liar because you said this would be fast. <laughs> Depends on, I, I prefer the, the, you know, the former but the other thing happens too. Um, and, and fortunately our mailing lists are full of people who are like love hacking performance, right? So this is always like, this is always kind of fun because everyone is just like, oh yeah, here are several like w cool ways you can make this much faster. And like frequently it's like orders of magnitude faster by the time you get done. So in this case, it was an interesting uh, journey in performance because uh, there were a couple of like the original, so the original Python version took 0.5 seconds to compute this, to figure out these uh, Kakuro puzzles are sort of, they're like, um, let me look them up. Uh, yeah, it's sort of this cross between a uh, Sudoku and a crossword. Um, and you have these like sums of digits in the corners uh, and you're supposed to use that to figure out like fill in the digits in the middle of the puzzle. I've, I've never played these but it's obviously like a nice little math puzzle that you can solve. Um, so he was writing a thing to solve these. Um, and the Python version took 0.5 seconds to solve. Um, the original naive Julia thing that he'd written was 13.4 seconds. And then with some minor tweaks, it got down to like 0.9 seconds. But then people kept sort of whittling away. That was mostly just like don't, you know, 
the Python version was, use, was pushing stuff onto arrays where the other one was like creating a new array every loop. So you're like, yeah, okay, allocating a new array every time is going to be slow. But we can also push onto the ends of arrays, so that's not a problem. Um, and then this, this guy, Jason Merrill, who's been around our, our community for a long time, came, like, got into this and like, really, really optimized the heck out of it. Um, and he got it down to 13 microseconds, which I was just like, okay, yeah, we get like, sometimes orders of magnitude performance improvements, but that's like, ridiculous. That's six orders of magnitude. Um, so how do you get a million x speed up on this? Um, so the original version, I'm, I'm not going to show you the code for the original version, but you can imagine what it's doing. It's like making arrays of digits and then sort of doing stuff to sum them, and whatever. And the, the breakthrough that, that, uh, that Jason had was he realized, well, hey, th in this language, it's actually really easy to make custom data types that are extremely efficient but also convenient to work with. So why don't I just make a custom data type for this digit set thing? Because it's doing all these digit set operations. Um, so he creates a digit set type, which is immutable, which means it can't be changed, which lets the compiler do nice things with it. It's also typical for like numerical things. You want them to be immutable because they're sort of identified by their value, not by some location in memory. Um, there's sort of like philosophy about that, but I think the, the, the easiest way to see why immutability might be nice is that there was a bug in an early Fortran compiler where you could mutate the value of integers because it actually stored integers the same way it stored other variables. So two was just like a name for a location in memory that happened to have the value two at it. And the bug was that you could change it. So you could write two equals three and then for the rest of the program two was three. <laughs> and like that's obviously crazy. You do not want to do that. Um, you can have similar fun in Python 2 by changing the values true and false. Um, that is allowed. They fixed that in, in Python 3. Um, so, you know, this is, there's, there's certain things that really should be identified by their value. If you change, if you change the like, imaginary part of a complex number, you don't have that complex number didn't change. You have a different complex number, right? Uh, whereas with like, arrays, for example, like, you can have the, the notion of an array containing different stuff at different times is coherent. That makes sense. The array is like a container. All right, so we define this immutable digit set. And uh, the observation here is that to represent a set of digits 1 through 9, you only need 9 bits, right? And uh, so an, an int 16 suffices. That gives you plenty of room to work with different subsets of digits. Um, and then the rest of this stuff is just ways to construct a digit set from an array. Um, the iteration protocol, so you know, Python has an iteration protocol. You can make this thing iterable in Julia, too. The, the length, so the length of a digit set is you count the number of ones in the bit representation of it. And this is a one instruction thing on x86. I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some x86 code in a second. I know you're excited. Um, uh, and then how to show the thing so it's nice and usable. And then some set operations, so union intersection, simdiff, uh, and set diff. Um, and these are just defined in terms of ands and ors of int, int uh, of the int field that's inside. So let's uh, evaluate this, uh, create one. I should actually, I should clear all the output to add suspense. Um, all right, so there we created a, a digit set. So you can see here that we can do things like, uh, oops, uh, the union. We can also use Unicode union. You can also write union, but we, the Unicode union is an alias for the other thing. So you can see the union of these two sets. Um, you can see the intersection. Uh, no, it's not. It's called cap in LaTeX. These are LaTeX escapes. Um, so you can see the intersection, 356. Um, I don't think that there is a, a fancy Unicode symbol for the symmetric difference, but that's the symmetric difference between the two. Um, so here's what's nice. Check out the code for this. Okay, so the native code for that is, so the, the first three instructions are actually just like, like set up for the function and the last two are just how you return from a function. The only thing that actually does anything here is this one or, w, or word instruction, which is the x86 instruction for, for oring two 16-bit bit things together. Um, and you can see the same thing for the code, the code native for the intersection is just that same thing except with an and. 
Um, and the sim diff, it's an XOR. So, I mean, this is pretty slick. This is very nice. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, also the count ones. Let's see what count ones. I haven't actually tried this one, but let's see. Uh, so length of A is five. Okay. Code native. Oh no, we blew it on that one. That's lousy code gen. Yeah. Uh, gonna have to file it, file an issue and fix that. Yes. Oh yeah, okay. Well, I mean, we ought to be able to do better than this, though. Um, okay, so now, now that we've got, so the nice thing about this is you can see that you interact with this thing as though it was just this array, but it's actually represented with this incredibly efficient encoding, and all the operations are incredibly efficient. So this is like, this is one of the, like, the mantras of Julia, zero cost abstraction. You get a real nice abstraction, but there is no cost to it whatsoever. Um, and that makes doing you know math stuff a lot lot easier because you get the you want to think in one level and you want the computer to operate at a very different level, and then you just need to connect those two. Um, so now you can just make this thing a lookup table because there really aren't that many of these combinations. So here's the code to do that, and then you can, for example, look up this guy and it is uh, a 12 element array of digit sets. Um, this is kind of cute. The size of S that array is 24 bytes. So it's two bytes per, and there's 12 of them. So this is 24 bytes to represent each of these, uh, one of these things. Um, now, doing the decomposition thing is just a lookup, um, and so we benchmark it. And so the first time you benchmark it, the first time you run something, it does JIT compilation. So remember I said Julia is dynamic, but it's compiled? That means that the first time you run something, you compile it. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to allocate some memory because the compiler runs. It's going to take a little bit of time. Um, but you know, you run things more than once, and the second time it's 10, 10 microseconds to actually do this computation that was taking 13 seconds before. And it's, you know, there's some variation, but that's it. Oh, uh, one thing I wanted to show, this Julia set code. Um, so the code native for this is just like a page full of instructions x86 instructions. So that is, this is pretty fast. Like, and this is, you know, this is actually, if you look at um, how this is defined, so, uh, you know, for example, let's say we wanted to add two complex numbers. So 1.5 plus 2m uh, plus 2.5 plus 3m. So that's adding two complex numbers, you know, which of course works. Uh, Let's say you want to see which method does that. So the, the plus function is actually this generic function with 206 methods. We can look at what the methods are like that. It takes a little while because there's a lot of them. Um, and you can see that this is all the ways of adding things that Julia knows about. This would sort of be baked into the compiler in most systems. But we actually just define it in Julia. You can actually click on a link here, and it takes you to the exact commit on GitHub that you are currently running to the line where it was defined. And you can see that the way it's defined is that if you want to add two complex numbers, you add their real parts and their imaginary parts, and you just make a new complex number out of it. But that still boils down to, that's like very high level of abstraction. These are, this is a parametric type. You're like going through many layers of dispatch, but it still boils down to just like a couple of instructions. Um, th also, this is what I was talking about with like breaking down barriers, right? Like the, the social barrier, like not only is it available, but like you click a link and you can see exactly where it's defined and you could change it if you wanted to. You would break stuff if you ch changed it, but like, you know, um, but you can. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, so that's, that's, okay. So now the, the final thing I'm gonna demo is this is gonna get a little, little more technical, but I kind of, I think, I think we can handle it. I think it'll be OK. Um, so this is an efficient implementation of savitsky golai smoothing. Has anyone heard of this? I had not heard of it until next, last week. But someone came up with this as a really good example of this. Uh, we do a lot of staged programming in Julia. So macros are a form of staged programming. JIT is also a form of staged programming. Uh, we have this new thing called generated functions, which is a like, really 
unusual but really nice form of stage programming. It essentially lets you, at the point where the compiler has figured out the types that it's going to call a function on, but bef you can actually hook in and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, for those types, I'm going to tell you what code to use for those particular combination of types. And you can generate the code using Julia and then run it. So I'm going to show you how this works. So what we do is we, we define a type for this filter, the Savitsky book Goli filter. Oh, I can't. I got to restart the kernel. There we go. All right. So I define a type for this. It doesn't actually have any fields because the only useful information is the type parameters, which are M and N. Uh, M is the like the window, the half size of the window uh, that you're smoothing, and N is how many moments you want to preserve. So the thing about the savitsky goli filter is it preserves the moments of your data. So the first central moment, second central moment, which is basically like the mean, uh, the variance, and like then higher up would be like the skewness and the kurtosis. So you can smooth the data while preserving those properties of it, which is a pretty nice thing. This was like a, a, an important paper when it came out, an important paper that I'd never heard of until last week. Um, <laughs> Um, so here's what we do. This is the actual function, the code that does this. And this is going to be a little bit crazy looking, but it's actually doing this in any other system that I know of would be like 10, like 100 times crazier. So what this says is this says, OK, if, you, if, if I would like to generate a filter for this for a particular M and N uh, on data of some type and smoothed, and a smoothed output, so we're going to write the, we're going to smooth the data in data and put it into the array smoothed, which has been pre-allocated by someone else for us. Um, and what you need to do to like to figure out how to do this smoothing is you actually need to construct a, a Jacobian matrix and then do a, a solve a backslash, which uh, is a like linearly squares solution, and then that tells you the coefficients for smoothing. The coefficients for smoothing don't depend on the data, though. They just depend on like, how many moments you want to preserve and how wide your window is. So that's why this is a good target for this. Um, and essentially, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to generate like, the optimal looped code that you could possibly write for this by hand for a particular M and N. But we're going to do it as soon as you actually want to call that. Um, and I will show you that. So this is the code that generates the code that then runs, which you'll see in a second. It's easier when you see the actual code that runs. Um, that's just some convenience methods. The data here is just going to be a range from 1 to 1,000. It's not even like an actual materialized array. It's just a range object, but it works. It doesn't matter. We'll specialize for that. So now we're going to do a, a three-wide filter, which means that three before and three after is what we're going to use for our smoothing. Uh, and the four means we want to preserve at least four central moments. And then we're going to apply it to the data, um, and we'll see what happens here. OK. Uh, and it's taking a second. So the reason it takes a second is because it's generating the code and then compiling that code. Uh, if we do it again, it's fast. Uh, and you can see that it you know, kind of vaguely looks like the input data, but it, is, you know, it sort of flanges at the ends, and it does some other stuff in the middle. Um, and actually, so in this generation code I did here, right here, I saved the expression that I generated into a global so that I could take a look at it later. So what I did there is I actually generated this code. So this is the code that was generated by that function, and this is what's actually running. And so you see we spliced in the actual coefficients that were computed based on M and N. Um, and so the, this is the actually important part. This is the branch-free middle of this that runs on most of the data. This is just a little fix up at the beginning, because you're actually running off the edge of the array, and we just wrap around. Uh, and the same thing at the bottom. But you want to separate those out, otherwise you, you have branches in your inner loop, and it's just going to be a nightmare for performance. This is the fast way to do it. Um, and so now we can see you can time this thing. So the first time, yeah, it takes a while, um, because we're doing that code generation. And then the second time, it's 50 microseconds. Um, I haven't timed this against anything else, because I don't, I, I don't have on hand a good library that does this sort of smoothing, but I think that's fast. I don't know. SciPy has it now? OK, we'll have to do a comparison and see how that goes. Um, and the interesting thing here, too, is you can look at, oh, I forgot to load stats base. There we go. Um, you can compare the moments, and you can see that the, the first pair of moments, you know, so the, the, the left-hand side is the act moments of the actual data. The right-hand side is the moments of the smooth data. And you can see that you know, negative 1.4 times 10 to the negative 15th is almost 0. Eight, you know, 83,000, and then you know, almost zero, and then 1.25 times 
10 to the 10th. So we are actually preserving pretty close the first four central moments, and then we sort of like trail off and don't quite make it anymore, uh, which was not guaranteed. So four was the, what we actually wanted. Um, so the cool thing here is that like, so let's say I want to do something with like, I don't know, uh, a width of seven for smoothing, and I want to do five central moments because like whatever. I just call this, and now you know it goes ahead and does that, and we can see that the expression that it used was this other crazy expression here. Um, in most systems, I, I don't know how you would do this. Like I don't know how you would stage this programming. Like in C++, you could do this, but you have to precompile all the combinations that you might ever want, which is a real pain, because um, you might not know until runtime what like combinations you actually want, or you know, you can't do this as a library in, in C++. You have to do it as a template. And that, that's, you know, that means you need a C++ compiler to even do this. Um, in other systems, I think you could do this, but it just won't be efficient. So this, I think, gives you a nice marriage um, of efficiency and usability. Uh, also, the nice thing is that from the user perspective, this is the library writer's perspective. I can see that this is like a little bit. You're like, you could be looking at this and be like, oh, this is a little scary. Um, from a user's perspective, you don't need to know any of this. Like, this thing just works. It's just a function, and it's just fast, and that's all. Um, so I think that is that is a pretty that's a pretty nice thing. Um, anyway, um, I think. Oh, one thing I wanted to end with: uh, if you go to juliabox.org, uh, all you need is a Google sign-in. We could expand it to other things, but that's what we got so far. Um, and you can just use Julia in a for free uh, in a notebook. Um, I don't know why this is taking so long to load. Ah, there we go. And there's actually there's a there's a tutorial, and you can just sort of evaluate stuff. It's a notebook format, so you don't really have to think much. You just kind of like go through and evaluate stuff, and then you can play with it. So. I have a bunch of stuff in there, but you can start here with like you know start the tutorial, um, and you can just run code. So you know the first thing you do try is like one plus one equals two. Uh, you know, rand. You get a different random number every time you do this, uh, and then you can click through to like the basics. Uh, so I encourage everybody to to try this out. Give it a shot. Even if you're not interested in doing a project just yet, give Julia a try and see if, how you like it. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? I'm going to take that as a yes. What does it compare to syntax, which is other languages like Python like or Java like? I, I mean, I guess the closest would be like MATLAB or Ruby. It's definitely in the, uh, the Algol school with like the end, end blocks. Um, Pascal also had similar syntax. Um, it's nice when you're cutting and pasting things, because that can get kind of gnarly in Python. Um, uh, yeah, it's when you, so like in statically compiled languages, it's you compile everything, and then you run. And those are completely se cleanly separated. Uh, in classic dynamic languages, there's no compilation. So it's just all runtime. Um, stage. Programming is where you interleave compilation and execution in various ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, there's, a, there's a package called PyCall, um, which lets you. Maybe I should demo it. I don't know. Uh, I, I can't. I'm not. I don't have time to demo it. But like, yes, you can do zero copy sharing of between NumPy and Julia. Um, it the the package was written by uh, Steve Johnson, who is also the author of FFTW, which probably people have heard of. It's like this insanely good FFT library that you've all used, whether you know it or not. Um, and uh, he's just amazing. And the stuff he did with that package is just incredible. You can call back and forth, for example, between Julia and Python functions recursively, and it just works. It's like not recommended, but it works. Um, yeah. uh, how good is performance? Like, how 
Commons versus something like uh, Python with, with uh, Numba or one of the other LLVM type things? Uh, so it's as good as C typically. So to the extent that those systems are as good as C, I guess they're comparable. To the extent that they're not, then it's not comparable. Um, I think that you know there, we're very much trying to do similar things. Uh, one of the nice things I think that Julia gives you is that this is the standard semantics. Like you don't have to opt into a different compiler or a different potentially different behavior. Like the normal behavior that everyone tested their program with is the one that's fast. Um, of course, the downside is it's a different language. So if you're really set on using Python, those other things are going to do that. And Julia is definitely not. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh -huh. I just created a vector from the design procedure and it called it convolution or game. Yeah. But, uh, so is the Julia runtime system embeddable in other programs or is it? Yes, but it's not like Lua where it's like a real small component that's going to be easy to embed. It's like, I mean, with, this is like everything in the kitchen sink. Um, we're working on that. We're going to, so we're stripping it down and targeting embedded infrastructure, in, in, like, uh, embedded architectures, but um, for now it's like it's a ton of stuff. But if you're willing to load a ton of stuff, then yes, you can embed it. Cool, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.